round of applause. Hello, Expand. How is everybody doing? OK, everybody's OK? Good? You feeling all right? Good, good to hear it. Uh, I am Ben Gilbert. I'm a senior editor here at Engadget. Uh, I'm going to take my seat because we've got a panel of distinguished folks coming out. Uh, I'm going to start with Martin, uh, I'm sorry, Marta Roel of Be Another Lab. Who I almost called Martin, despite the fact that I asked him his name like six times before I came out here. Uh, the next person we have coming up is Matt Bell of Matterport, the CEO of Matterport, or uh, founder of Matterport, I believe. He's carrying with him a, uh, a camera and a uh, Gear VR Innovator Edition headset from Samsung. The camera is his, though. And uh, the, our final guest is uh, Ebe Altberg, the CEO of uh, Linded Lab, who you might have heard of from Second Life and uh, other fine products. So today we're talking about uh, virtual reality, but we're talking about virtual reality as it uh, pertains to non-gaming stuff. So as you can see, we've got a bunch of folks here who are not making video games, but they are working in virtual reality in some aspect. So uh, Marte, you, uh, you're working with Be Another, you are the founder of Be Another, co-founder? Co-founder. Co-founder of Be Another Lab. And uh, you guys did a really interesting project called uh, The Machine to Be Another. So I kind of wanted to start talking about that. Could you just set that up and, and tell people what that is a little bit? Sure. Uh, our main objective is to build empathy between individuals doing body swapping through individuals from different communities or different genders. So that uh, it's a, the idea is that if you can better understand the other, you might be able to better understand yourself. And we're using uh, technology and virtual reality and telepresence not really for building new uh, in, uh, worlds, which is great, but to coming back to the, our real vulnerable um, space here of presence and understanding uh, communities. And we're even applying it for conflict resolution with partnerships with the United Nations and other key people. Um, I want to say that our project is open source. It, it's a creative, we have a creative common license. So the idea is that anyone can sh can spread our, our idea of making em building empathy between individuals and replicate this idea in different communities across the world. And I was just asked, uh, yeah, our protocol is, is a bit complicated. So, so the replication is really, will come from people wanting to pursue these rather than from people wanting to consume our, uh, our application, but that want to build their own in their contexts. So in the, in the case of the machine to be another, that was uh, an art project where, uh, is art project a correct way of uh, categorizing that? I, yeah, I think. Yeah, definitely. Maybe so multi interdisciplinary project, but yeah. So the, the basic concept though is, you know, there's two people and one's a female and one's a male, at least in the video that was shown. And uh, they each have a, an, a VR headset on and it's also got a camera feeding out. So it's, it's feeding the other person's VR headset though, the vision that is on the camera of one person, right? It's kind of hard to explain, but the concept is basically that you're seeing the world through the other person's eyes, right? Exactly. And so that's really meant, this is kind of, I, you spoke about conflict resolution, stuff like that. And I, I think that is, that's really the application of stuff like that, right? Yep, definitely. I, I do want to say that that project, which is perhaps the, more popul the most popular one that we have online, sure. is called the gender swap experiment. Okay. The machine to be another protocol is a bit different where we have one performer, only one camera. Okay. It's, no, it's a, a, a body change, <coughs> not swap. So one uh, user is becoming the performer, mm -hmm. but not both of them are swapping bodies. It's a bit different, the interaction protocol. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's a bit more powerful, the machine to be another mm -hmm. protocol, but, but the gender swap experiment uh, really exemplifies our, our goals. Yeah. Okay, uh, and Matt, uh, you, mm -hmm. uh, you and the folks at Matterport, you guys are making technology to map the interiors of, of, of spaces, right? I don't, I don't want to say mm -hmm. just buildings, this could be caves, it could be whatever exactly. else, right? So uh, can yeah. you give the, the people a little bit of an idea of what, what Matterport's doing? Sure, so we're solving the 3D content creation problem. Right now, it's very hard to create 3D content from scratch. You know, you need to spend a couple of years learning a program like Maya, and then creating a digital copy of, say, a house with all of its furniture and furnishings and all the paintings on the walls. 
even like an expert um, Maya user, it would still take them several days to build a digital 3D model of a house. So you can think of it as, as kind of like the realm of painting as opposed to photography. You know, you need to be an expert and you need to spend a lot of time. What we're doing is we're making 3D content creation as easy as photography. So this camera I brought out, um, you can use this camera to build a 3D model of a typical 2,000 square foot house in about half an hour. Just move the camera from room to room. It spins around on its own. You put it in a couple of different places in each room. And it stitches together everything it sees in 3D to build a full 3D model of that house that you can then explore. So our camera's for sale already. Uh, we started selling it about six months ago, and we've seen huge pickup across a variety of industries, but especially real estate. You know, it's incredibly powerful to be able to shop for a house by viewing 3D models of all the houses you're interested in, as opposed to having to physically drive to every house. And so that way you could virtually visit 100 houses as in an hour, as opposed to physically visiting maybe one. And so what we're doing with virtual reality is we're then making it easy for people to quickly construct virtual worlds by just finding any spot in the physical world that they find interesting, capturing it with our camera, and then you can go explore that in VR. And so whether you're shopping for a house or wanting to visit a faraway site, like say the Angkor Wat temples in Cambodia, or access some place that's you know, too difficult or not available to the public or otherwise just hard to visit, we can take all of those places and put them online such that you'll be able to, in an instant, drop in and physically be walking around that space in VR. So it's really about building a, a kind of a foundation for other people to create content with in that sense. Exactly, yeah. We're, we're empowering all the 3D content creators out there and people who didn't ev even know they could be 3D content creators. Like me, for instance. I, I certainly can't write in, yeah. in Maya, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, and uh, Ebe, uh, you guys uh, at Linden Lab, Lab, singular, I found out today. I did not realize that. that one lab. Just one lab. Yeah. Uh, you... Uh, are of course well known for Second Life, but there's, uh, there's some other applications you guys have. You have Blocks World, uh, and uh, recently I believe you've started moving Second Life into VR as well, right? Yeah, so um, Second Life is a product that's been around for 11 years. Um, just had its 11th birthday, still going strong. Uh, it's the biggest, most successful virtual world that's ever been created to this date. Um, and uh, users in there uh, use it to create all kinds of experiences, from entertainment to education to health to uh, art um, and all things in between. Um, you have universities using it. Texas A&M is using it to teach chemistry to students in a virtual setting. So it's, it's almost, you can create anything you can imagine. Everything in Second Life is user generated. Mm -hmm. We're not in the content business. We're in a, a platform and a world with certain horizontal capabilities like virtual currency and communication tools, stuff like that, but all the experiences people go through are created by other users, so anyone can create whatever they want. Um, that's, that's, that's the big product we have that's still paying all the bills. <laughs> um, we also have just started uh, fairly recently a really neat product for, for kids to build uh, worlds and experiences and games called Blocks World for the iPad. Um, kids love it. It's like four and a half stars in the store and, and the fact that kids can build worlds and experiences that other kids can then play and like and they can earn coins by other kids playing their games and their experiences and it's fascinating to see what, what kids can create with that. Um, and then yeah, we have announced that uh, we are working on a, a huge project, a next generation virtual world type of product mm -hmm. that will sort of take off um, way beyond what Second Life can do today. Uh, sure. when it comes to graphic fidelity, physics, um, uh, avatar uh, capabilities, uh, communication capabilities. Um, so uh, that will take quite a while, but we plan to start opening the door for some early sort of 
high-end users, if you want to call it that, uh, to start uh, kicking the tires of it uh, towards the middle of next year. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to get you guys all uh, here talking about the kind of baseline for certain virtual reality stuff, right? We're still really early with virtual reality, despite the fact that it's existed in some extent for 20 or 30 years, right? Um, it still feels really new as a medium. There's still a lot of stuff that hasn't been done yet in terms of figuring out how to monetize things or how to create things uh, that are other than games and entertainment, right? Uh, so uh, you guys are all doing things that are not game things with VR, and I, I guess I'm wondering about the other kind of uh, applications that are out there for VR beyond games, right? Like what other stuff are, are we not doing that we haven't seen yet? So Second Life, for example, um, is not a game. There's nothing that we tell you up front that you should be doing or a path to go. So you can go to any experience. And so it's, it's social, right? I mean, it's, it's really so meant it's as a social place for socializing experience. in right. a virtual space. Um, so there's a lot of very strong and interesting communities and use cases that's being used for. But there's also a huge marketplace uh, that Linden Virtual Currency, uh, the GDP inside of Second Life is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, uh, we cash out to creators that sell the content they create. It could be anything from virtual shoes to hair to houses to cars to boats sure, sure. or anything you can create. And uh, we people cash out about a million dollars a week in total uh, of the content that they create uh, on the platform. So it's uh, a lot of people make a living on the virtual uh, services and goods they create within Second Life. So there's there's lots of business models you can do without being a game uh, in the virtual context. And uh, what about art applications, right? Or, or interactivity applications or other kind of things that you could be doing with people that... I, I think that you've done a great job with something like uh, the... I, I can't remember the name of it, the, the one that I mischaracterized. It's not the machine to be another, gender but... Gender swap experiment. The gender swap experiment. Uh, it, it's such an immediate realization of something you can do with it to express something that isn't necessarily... It's an immersion aspect, right? It's really based on the immersive aspect of VR, but it's really not meant to... I, I don't know, it's not... I, it's experiential, and it's you're meant to feel things from it, but it's not in... Maybe not interactive in the same way. I'm having a hard time characterizing other ways that you could do that with yeah, artistic expression, basically, mm -hmm. in virtual reality. It's interesting because uh, it's hard to... to to put in a, in a category, but for sure. in a way, it's technically telepresence, not not necessarily virtual reality. Right, right. But we're using, a, a, um, we're developing interaction protocols so that the experience is very immersive, perhaps even more than most virtual reality applications. In the sense that we have uh, haptic feedback, mm -hmm. uh, we have other performers in the machine to be another that. So as you see someone coming to yourself to say hello, you actually grab a real hand and with force, with uh, uh, yeah, the texture of a real hand. Right. And when you connect these two aspects, the visual and the uh, proprioceptive feedback, the experience just takes a different level. And I think that understanding how these different modalities interact, or sensory modalities interact in the brain, mm -hmm. is really going to change the way I in which we will understand virtual reality in the coming years. It's still, it, it, you brought this up a, a bit with the, the haptic feedback thing, but I, I find that the first thing I do when I step into virtual reality is want to do things that I can't do. I put up my hands, I want to touch things, I want to feel things, <laughs> I want to <laughs> shout and have that heard yeah. in virtual reality, and none of that is possible uh, yet, at least, right? And so it's, uh, there's this, all this promise of immersion, yet there's still all these other steps to overcome. And this is something I really wanted to make sure that we talked about here, because I know, for instance, Matt, you guys at Matterport are doing something to try to overcome the content creation aspect of things, but in that same yeah. respect, it doesn't necessarily map, you know, the smells of that world or, or the smell light of vision or that's coming. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, not. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, actually. Uh, but yeah. there's all these other aspects to immersion that aren't being solved yet in virtual reality, and I'm, yeah. I don't know how to overcome that. I don't. So yeah. A lot of that is coming. Um, I feel like all the, the pieces of the 3D ecosystem are like coming together as quickly as they can. For sure. Um, the key one that I think is lagging but catching up is 3D input devices. And while you technically can use a keyboard and mouse while being in VR, it's, it's pretty rough. It breaks and immersion, so for sure, absolutely. Exactly. Even and a so gamepad breaks immersion. It's I know, yeah. Right. And so some of the best stuff I've seen is hand-based, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in a 3D world, when you, when you walk around the physical world, you're using your voice and your hands to do things, 
right? So you, you want it to be that way in virtual worlds as well. And there are a couple of companies that are building um, real-time gesture tracking. Sure. So that you'll be able to like, reach out and touch things. A uh, big one is Leap Motion. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are also little companies like NimbleSense yep. that have been doing hand tracking. I just that used it the other week. Excellent. It's, it's yeah. cool, yeah, absolutely. And I think that will help out a lot, and that will like unlock new genres of content. Like just watching what's happened with smartphones over the last few years, mm -hmm. like there was this initial like Cambrian explosion of apps when it was first available. And then anytime some new sensor came on board, like, oh, now we have a good compass, or now we have a front-facing camera, that there was this other explosion of apps that happened. Sure, so sure. And I, I expect we'll see that as each new like input device comes in. I I I wonder what that solution will. Uh, uh, hand tracking solves one thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But there's so much more beyond that, right? I mean, I, we joked about smell vision, but that's a huge aspect of being yeah, a human yeah. being is smelling mm. the world around. I mean, the nostalgia that is inflicted by smelling something that you haven't smelled in ten years or whatever. But it's yeah, yeah. You, know, I, you open a toy when you're a little kid, and it has a smell like a certain type of plastic. You remember that smell, right? I mean, it's yeah. goofy to talk about smell of vision, but that stuff matters, right, for immersion. Right. I don't know how I to get past that. Well, there, there, I mean, there's some trade-offs. I mean, ultimately, completely replicating the total feeling of the, f the, f the physical presence we have here is going to take a long time to for get sure. all the haptic The holodeck back. kind of but thing. But then right? at the same time, there's things you can do in virtual space that you can't even come close to being able to do in this space. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so in Second Life, you can fly, and I can go to different countries, and I can meet other yeah. people that are uh, on the other side of the world and, and actually have a social meeting with 50 people in a space. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't do that in this world. So there, there's, there's some pros and cons. Absolutely. And it's yeah. not necessarily about trying to get to equality between the two. Mm -hmm. um, so, but obviously there's th a lot of it thanks to Oculus lately because there's been a lot of people working on, on all these problems for a very long time. For sure. But mm -hmm. with Oculus now, you're seeing an inflection point where a lot of startups and companies whether what these guys are doing or what we're doing and many, many others, that it's we're going to see an acceleration in the capabilities of input. I mean, Leap is, uh, and these guys is, is great. Um, because as soon as, uh, in Second Life today, you can already use the Oculus uh, to cruise around all of this content that users created. But yeah, the keyboard and the mouse is, is not the ideal. And even a game pad is not ideal. So sure. obviously hand, I believe as well, hand motion mm -hmm. tracking is going to be critical. <coughs> other aspects is just, body and facial rec recognition so Absolutely. that I can transmit through an avatar in virtual space my, mm. my emotions, my expression. Yeah. Can someone see that I'm happy, sad, angry, uh, which is not that easy today, but those are also being solved. So there's, there's a lot of things that are going to make it peep, uh, virtual space a much more social and connected and emotional place. Um, and. Uh, Soon we'll, we'll all be able to have Thanksgiving dinner with our families, even though we're all over the world in one mm -hmm. physical s uh, virtual space together. You're so going to get gravy all over your headset, though. It's yeah. the whole situation. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's going pretty fast, sure. uh, even though it's taken a long time. So it's a really exciting time. OK. Uh, it, I, let's, let's see where we are here. Uh, the kind of ma mainstream adoption stuff is another big point I want to touch on here. And You've got a Gear VR actually on you, Matt. Could you, yeah. could you hold it up for a second so folks can see it? Sure. So the Gear VR is, it runs on a Note 4. You put a Note 4 inside of it, uh, and that's the there screen, right? That's, that's what you're using. It's a virtual reality headset uh, that's kind of ready-made. Uh, but putting on a headset is kind of silly, right? Uh, I, I know that for me, I, I play a ton of games online. And yeah. uh, putting the, the headset on, just a headset, not a virtual reality headset, but a microphone headset for me is like, oh man, I feel yeah, yeah. really silly. I, it's, uh, maybe that's just me, but yeah. that barrier to entry for a lot of people, I think the mainstream stuff, I don't know how that's gonna, how that's gonna work, right? Like I don't, it, there's a lot of things that the kind of more human stuff that you guys are doing, I think yeah. it's really hard to engage that with the kind of technology that's out there so far. I, 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 I'm interested in hearing how you can get past that with current technology, basically. I mean, I, I completely agree that ease of use of this stuff. I mean, today, you obviously have the hardcore users that will do anything to have these experiences, and they'll overcome yeah. any complexities to, to get there. Sure. But for mass market appeal, ease of use and comfort uh, is going to be critical to get right. Mm -hmm. and, and these devices, uh, Oculus and the Gear VRs, they're going to continue to get it lighter and lighter, more comfortable, um, and ultimately, 
putting that on and being able to go to a completely different place and meet people and socialize or uh, what training, go to, go to class. What, would I rather hop in my car and drive across the city and go to a classroom or just put sure. a thing on my face and boom, I'm in the classroom talking to a teacher and other students and I'm in that space. Absolutely. Well, yeah. it's obviously much more convenient to put something on my face than drive across town. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the form factors and the comfort um, will continue to improve where ultimately the, it will be mass market because there's just so much power mm -hmm. in the experiences that we can create. And uh, what about for you guys? I, I think that uh, for us, we're in a great moment in that sense because our, our focus is research, art, working with communities, and we don't care so much about the huge market, although we would love to expand our project. Sure. But but we f we feel comfortable with the technologies that we current have, and we have been able to overcome some of the issues that you said, such as the haptic feedback, because we can we really use two objects. One the object that's the, that the user is grabbing and one object that the performer is grabbing, and, and we overcome that step with technology that has been around forever. You know? and, and I think that for us, this performative and, and this, the idea of having real objects is really something even poetic that we don't really mind having with us, and, and we're not. We uh, obviously understand that for the consumer market, it, it, it's not the most comfortable thing. And we're looking for protocols so that we can replicate or have versions of our system that can be used by anyone. But so far, for us, it's been, a, it's, uh, yeah, we haven't had any of these issues as real problems. So, I, I mean, I'm even saying specifically with something like the gender swap project where there's lag introduced, right? I mean, it's something as basic as that with there's a, a video feed on the front of their headset and there's you're introducing a layer of lag and that can either make people sick or it can also just break immersion for some folks, right? Like you have to carefully move a little bit slower than you would normally as a human being as a result. And that lessens the impact a little bit, right? Yeah, no, that, that's completely true. Although it also gives, uh, maybe I'm too optimistic, but um, it, it also makes the experience uh, asking users to move slowly sure. and gently. Uh, it makes the experience more, uh, people are more careful about the experience and, and pay more attention to what they're doing. So they're more, more present, which for us is important. So at the end, w so far, it hasn't been an issue, but uh, definitely I, I understand your That's question. interesting. That's, it's almost like it introduces, a, it's like a benefit to an extent that they have to move more slowly because they, that's, that's actually a, so, a yeah. fascinating application of using latency <laughs> in technology that you can't beat really, right? Like it's, I don't know how to beat that. The well, the we, stuff, we actually know? don't have that much latency. We right. uh, so far, it, it, it's unnoticeable. We're working at 60 frames per second and, and it's, uh, we, we notice that the frame rate does make a huge difference. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, but, but the, the la we haven't had any issues with latency, I think. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so uh, th I'm trying to see, see where this stuff goes next. Uh, you talked about this a little bit, Eba, in terms of Ebe, excuse me. I'm going to keep mispronouncing your name. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, education, uh, maybe health stuff, uh, there's the concept of virtual tourism that you spoke a little bit about, Matt. Uh, different places where, this, where virtual reality can go beyond what we've seen so far, right? Like mm -hmm. Gear VR is totally neat. It's just an entertainment device, basically. Basically. I mean, that's not a bad thing, it's, but it's an entertainment device rather than all these other things. Actually, I'd, I'd describe Gear VR more as a... So, I'm not speaking for a Samsung or Oculus. This <laughs> is my personal opinion. Disclaimer. Um, so, to me, this is, this is really VR for the masses just because the simple lack of any cables tethering you to something makes it feel a lot more comfortable. And the fact that it's on a mobile phone means that... It is a very general platform that people could take in any direction. Sure. And so I think we're, you know, you talk about the future direction of VR. It's kind of like, you know, where where is the internet going to go? It's just, it's such a broad category, or it will be over the next few years. I think it's basically going to go in about 10 directions at once, right? And we're going to see very broad adoption across a wide variety of applications. Everything from entertainment to, like, very serious things like, oh, I need to map out this building and get a sense of where it is before I run in as like a, you know, as a fireman. Sure. That kind of thing. Absolutely. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm very optimistic about broad adoption of this. 
Okay. Uh, and I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm trying to think of other other stuff, though, right? Like in terms of art applications, in terms of the things yeah. that you were speaking about, Ebe, uh, regardless of the Gear VR or anything like that, yeah. uh, the other ways that this could be used for maybe rehabilitation? or I, I mean, it's already kind of used in some of these applications, yeah, but a lot of that is very, very expensive. Absolutely. So is it really just a question of bringing down the price as it becomes more of a mainstream thing? The, the prices will come down, obviously. Of course. Um, yeah. And the uh, it, it will come down to mass uh, consumer pricing levels. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, we're, we're focusing it from what what anyone can create because there are too many use cases. So we're not focusing on just health or just education. Sure. Or just, uh, we're, we're ultimately creating a platform so that all of those types of experiences can be created. And we do all the hard work to make sure that it's possible to, to do this in a performant and uh, a rich way. Um, but even today, even in, in Second Life, that's been around for 11 years, all, like the use cases are uh, about as broad as, as the use cases for what we do in our real lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it'll just continue to expand. So uh, anything people do, um, uh, sort of learning how to use new equipment, um, uh, mental health, helping people with phobias, you're yeah. afraid of heights, uh, public speaking. I've been in a virtual reality experience where I'm in front of an audience like this and I see the reflection of myself back there, but I'm not me, I'm a princess which helps me take myself out of the equation, which makes me more comfortable speaking in front of an audience. And then hopefully on, on an opportunity like this, it's, it's helped me. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, so the, it's, it's like an infinite number of potential use cases for it. So um, that's why I don't think of it as, when people ask what's the killer app, it's not really, there's gonna be lots of killer apps, sure. uh, just like it is on the internet in general, uh, or in the world in general. So I think of VR as more of a horizontal thing that's going to be something you can apply to almost anything you're trying to do. Um, and uh, um, so there's going to be a lot of, a lot of interesting applications uh, over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm wondering how soon you guys think this is coming, right? Uh, so uh, Gear VR is coming out this year, uh, and that's the soonest it would be. But otherwise, there's still a lot of there's technological issues, there's financial issues, there's all these other things. I mean, we've talked about a lot of this on the course of this panel. Uh, I, I, I'm still, a lot of the talk about VR is still, you know, it's coming. It's, it's on the way, it's coming soon. And I'm, I'm part of that problem. I've been saying that myself. So I, is, is this the next couple of years? Is it more like the internet? Is it 10 years from now? Is no, it 20 no, no. years it's, from now? Is it's it's it a couple of years. I mean, it's for, for those of us that, that really want it, it's already here. I mean, I experienced yes, it. No. I, I ex mean, I have the DK2, and I'm going to get a Gear VR, and it's sort of there, but it's like, it's still an ancillary thing for me. It's not my main form of interaction with a lot of, uh, whether it's entertainment or whatever else. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I used a DK2 at work and uh, in Second Life, and probably after 30 minutes, I start to get a little bit tired. Sure. Um, and that's because, you know, frame rates and resolutions and all that. But all of these things are getting solved really quickly. Sure. So I think you will see something that is comfortable for consumers um, sometime next year. And then how quickly will software figure out how to, or, or content, if you will, figure out how to sort of take advantage of this new medium? Um, it'll take a while for people to figure out how to operate there because techniques that a lot of gaming companies have used over the years to do 3D sure. um, doesn't really completely apply directly to how things are done in, in a, a true virtual 3D space. Um, There's so a lot of hiding and it's yeah, you 3D, can't you, know? you can't you can't fake textures right. and stuff like that. It, it has to be real because once once you're in there, you you can tell that it's fake. I can go uh, put my face right up to it and look. Yeah, and and I, yeah. the first and thing I do. That right? it's, That's it's the first thing everybody it's, does. It's it's a flat yeah. surface that pretends to be bumpy. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. so um, so we we. We ship Oculus support for Second Life, not necessarily because it's the ultimate be and all companion between those oh two, right. because Second Life probably won't get to the level of performance we really need, which is why we started a new project to solve all those problems. But sure. it helps us understand user interface, navigation, um, content creation, and for all of our creators to start understand what does it mean to create content and experiences that takes advantage of that new medium. And then when, when it gets more and more uh, broadly adopted, and we already have learned a lot of things that sort of help us sort of get to the real solutions in the end. So it's, it's, a, it's a real fun time, though, to uh, figure all this out.
it's it's certainly fascinating to watching all this stuff happen, right? Yeah. Like uh, yeah. seeing projects like you, the one you guys are working on, seeing the camera yeah. you guys have, and seeing the stuff you guys are doing with Second Life is it's fascinating seeing the beginnings of all this stuff. It's all very foundational, it seems right now, uh, and I, I'm very excited for the future. That's for sure. I, what do you, what's what's up next for each of you guys? Maybe we should start here. Um, I think that we have a very wide range of possibilities at this point. We're very excited with what's coming. Uh, we're starting to collaborate with MIT. We're hoping to go into communities that have conflicts within them and, and work in conflict resolution and uh, uh, research what, what is cognitive in cognitive science. In what sense specifically? I'm sorry, with regards to the conflict resolution stuff, that's, that's very interesting. What From gender violence to uh, inter... Uh, uh, racial violence or... Oh, I, I don't so mean that. I mean in terms of how that would actually work, right? Is it just putting... Well, the thing is that there's not a, a specific how-to. Our, our approach is we go to a community, we work on this with the community, so we, we, we create the knowledge that is needed to approach the problem together with the people. We, we don't impose the, the problem nor the solution. So that's really how we work and we just provide them a t with a tool that might help us to overcome their problems. And okay. Yep. And uh, and how about you guys at Matterport? What's is there a, yeah. a Gen two camera coming or, or something like that? Oh, uh, we've got a, a lot of wonderful things happening. Uh, very quickly, um, so we are working on a Gen two camera, but we're also looking at there are mobile OEMs who are building three D sensors into tablets. Okay. And so starting next year, you'll be able to buy a tablet with a built-in 3D sensor. And that means that with a device that's in your pocket or in your purse, you can pull that out and capture the room you're in or some sculpture you're looking at or anything in the world around you in 3D and then share that online. So we're turning everyone into 3D content creators. Separately, in terms of VR, what we're doing is we know there are a lot of people who want to create VR content. And so we're creating a software module that will then allow third parties to pull any Matterport data into, um, or Matterport content into apps they're, they're generating. And finally, we want to build the, <laughs> yeah, there we go, <laughs> plop. Uh, we want to build the, the virtual reality YouTube for 3D spaces. So just imagine being able to go and there have millions of amazing spaces around the world be able to instantly drop into any of them in virtual reality and walk around and have the experience of being there and exploring them with other people. And so very broadly, that's, this is all about building the metaverse, right? So we're the metaverse of what exists and you guys are the metaverse of, of what you can create and what you can imagine and there's every possible mix of the two. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and you guys have it? Uh, well, I'm, I'm excited about what they're doing because um, I'd love to be able to take my living room, boom, and then upload it into what we're working on and then invite my family, and here we are in my living room here in the U.S. with my family that's back in Sweden. Hmm. Um, and that, you know, in a, in a couple of years, hopefully that is not a big ordeal to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, like I said earlier, we, we are spending a huge amount of uh, energy to building a next generation platform for content creators to be able to create virtual spaces and, and socialize and uh, do commercial activity within those spaces um, and ultimately be able to run businesses. Um, if I'm in the business of creating classroom for students to learn certain subjects or health clinics or, um, or even tourists or, or games, how do I create these experiences? So today it takes a tremendous amount of technical hardcore skill to do that. Sure. And we want to be able to bring it to the masses to be able to create things like this, just like, like a WordPress brought sort of web publishing to the masses versus having to build like a whole you know, web stack and uh, hosting sure, sure. servers and all that stuff. We want to take that burden off of users so they can just focus on creating experiences and sharing those experiences and socializing within those experiences. So okay. that's what we're working on. And we're Hiring are crazy, so go to lindenlab.com, <laughs> <laughs> apply. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This has uh, been VR Beyond Gaming, <coughs> and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. <laughs>